Listen only mode. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining today's webinar on furlough. Your uh, your questions answered. Um, I'm delighted to say uh, today's presentation has been uh, led by uh, Charlotte Hagestad and Tim Thomas, both from our sort of employment law and policy team at, uh, at Make UK. Um, just before we get you know, in straight into uh, into the furlough uh, presentation. Just some housekeeping rules, uh, really. There's, uh, as you can imagine, there's quite a few of us on the, on the session today, um, so the lines are on mute. Um, if you've got any questions, do put those questions through in the question box, which you should be able to see in the corner of your screens uh, right now. Although we've got two presenters, I'm delighted to say we've got the the full full weight of the legal team behind us answering those questions, and we'll try and get through as many questions as we possibly can via that sort of question box that's uh, open on your on your screen right now um so yeah as as we progress through the session please feel free to, to get your questions through and we'll get through as as many as we possibly can and we, we've also got a little bit of time at the end for some q a um with uh, with charlotte and, and, and tim uh, too um i should say this session's been recorded and a copy of that recording will be sent out to all registrants and put on the um, the coronavirus hub which is on the, the make uk uh, web page at the moment as well um so look without further ado i'll hand you over to uh, charlotte who will take you through the first part of uh, today's uh, presentation Thank you, Roger, and good morning to everybody. Now, if you've listened to our webinar last week, you'll find that some of the content in this morning session will be a bit familiar, but we are taking into account government guidance that's been updated since then. Um, so there, there is plenty of new information as well. We've definitely got more answers than we did last week, but there are still quite a few areas where we are waiting for more government clarification. And that's something that our team and Tim Thomas, my co-presenter, is working very hard on at the moment and is in contact with number 10 and the, and the Treasury and other government departments. Moving on now to the, to the agenda. If you just have a quick look through there, you'll see we've got a lot of things that we're going to be covering today. We'll be starting off with looking at eligibility for furlough. We're gonna look at the process for putting people on furlough, how to operate and also look at some tricky issues around pay and holiday. We've also got some really detailed FAQs on our coronavirus hub on the Make UK website. And these include lots of questions which we won't have time to cover today and also a lot more background detail on some of the things we are looking at. So do take a look at those after the session. First then, a quick overview of the furloughing scheme for those who didn't manage to join our webinar last week. So what is furlough? It's not a term we've, we've used before in UK employment law. Essentially, what it is is a new form of leave or authorised absence, which the government has made available via, via its coronavirus job retention scheme. So if you're a business that's struggling to provide any work for an employee because of the current crisis, this scheme will enable you to keep employees on your payroll whilst they're not working, so that they're ready to begin work for you again when the crisis is over. The other significant benefit of the scheme is that you won't have to bear the costs of salary during the furlough period, as you'll be able to claim for 80% of furloughed employees' usual monthly wage costs, up to £2,500 a month. And you'll also be able to claim for the associated employer NIC contributions and minimum automatic enrolment employer pension contributions on that wage. There's no obligation to top this up to an employee's full salary, though you can if you want to. And also there's no size limit to company. So all UK businesses are eligible under the scheme, provided you had a payroll scheme up and running on and before the 28th of February this year, and you've got a UK bank account. The employer guidance now explains that any business whose operations have been severely affected by COVID-19 will be eligible. And this is intended to run for at least three months from the 1st of March, although it may well be extended if necessary. The guidance also makes clear that furlough leave has got to be taken in a block of a minimum of three weeks. You'll be able to reclaim the payments from HMRC by providing information about employees who've been furloughed and their salaries on an online portal. That portal's not yet open, it should be ready at the end of April. And at that point, you'll be able to uh, start to get payments back. There's a detail about the sort of information you'll need to include on that online portal in our FAQs which are online, the ones which I previously mentioned. Next, I'm going to look at exactly who can be furloughed. 
And for most individuals, it's quite clear whether you can or can't put them on furlough, but there are a few areas where there's a lack of clarity. Starting with what we do know, government guidance is really clear that the following individuals can potentially be furloughed. That's full-time employees, part-time employees, fixed-term employees, and employees who are on flexible or zero hours contracts. You can only furlough employees who've been on your payroll since the 28th of February 2020. So if you've got any employees who started with you after then, unfortunately, you won't be able to claim for them under the scheme. For employees on fixed term contracts, we assume that their eligibility will cease on the date when their fixed term was otherwise due to end. But actually, over the last few days, we have had quite a few queries from member companies who are hoping to be able to extend the contracts of their fixed term employees who are on furlough beyond the original date. And there's evidence on have asked for government confirmation of the position. But for the moment, I think we need to take the view that if you'd actually been intended to extend the fixed term period before furlough occurred, then it probably is possible to stick to that and agree extension with the employee to keep them on furlough for a bit longer if that had been your original plan. What about employees who've already left the business? Well, the government guidance is clear that you can use the scheme to furlough employees if you've made redundancy of February if you rehire them. And there have been reports in the in, about this being extended to individuals who've also left voluntarily, not just those who've made redundant. But if you want to do this, there are just a couple of pointers to bear in mind, a few practical issues. First of all, you're going to have to contact them, get their agreement to be re-employed and their consent to be furloughed. Um, their furlough leave will then be you you will then be able to backdate their furlough leave to the date to the later of the date their employment terminated or the 1st of March 2020. But of course you'll be putting employees back on payroll and then you'll need to think about whether and how to pick on the unpicking payment arrangements that you give them. And of course the portion is that at the end of the furlough these individuals will of course still be employees. So if redundancies are necessary at that point, you'd need to get a new redundancy process. Now the job re retention scheme is expressly stated to be available for employees who are shielding. And this covers those 1.5 million extremely vulnerable individuals who are most at risk if they contract the virus. And it applies whether or not you do have a job for them to do. It's probably worth just quickly mentioning that we've heard from quite a few of our companies about employees who haven't yet had a letter confirming that they fall within the shielding category from the NHS, even though they've got some really quite serious conditions like being on kidney dialysis. And so it seems to us that the letters are maybe being a bit slow, so just be aware that the system isn't working perfectly yet. Finally, on this slide, it's also possible to place employees on furlough who have been on unpaid leave if that started after the 28th of February. So if you've laid off employees on no pay, since the 28th of February, you can now move them on to furlough and backdate that furlough period to the 1st of March or the date they first went on layoff, whichever um, is the later. Moving on now to those employees whom we know for certain can't be furloughed. Well, the government guidance makes clear that employees who are on sick leave and receiving statutory sick pay can't be furloughed. And on Wednesday, there were some new statutory sick pay regulations published and those clarify the circumstances in which employees who are absent for a COVID-19 reasons can receive SSP. So if we combine these two things, it's clear that employees who are self-isolating with symptoms or self-isolating because someone in their household had symptoms, those two sets of employees can't be furloughed whilst they are self-isolating and receiving the sick pay. In addition, you can't furlough employees who are off sick and receiving SSP for a non-COVID-19 reason. All of these employees, they can be furloughed with their consent, obviously, once their period of self isolation or sick leave ends and they'd otherwise be returning to work. And finally, on this slide, there are just a couple of points that will be obvious from the previous slide, that new starters who began work for you after the 28th of February and anyone on unpaid leave on the 28th of February or before, unfortunately, can't be furloughed under the government scheme, with the caveat that you don't yet know how this interacts with unpaid family leave or unpaid sick leave, but we've asked the government for some clarification. In terms of the categories of individuals where there's still a bit of a level of uncertainty as to whether or not you can further them under the government scheme, 
um, probably the most difficult category to deal with or to, to have to answer for is those employees who can't or don't want to come to work for a COVID-19 reason when you would not otherwise be considering furloughing them. So in other words, you do have work for them, to, but they, they're finding it difficult to come to work at the moment. And this might be an employee who can't work for childcare reasons or employees who are in the vulnerable category, but not shielding. Equally, it could be employees who are caring for or living with someone who's vulnerable or shielding and employees or employees who are just simply nervous about coming to work in the current climate. I mean, obviously, if you don't have work for them to do, they can, of course, be furloughed under the, un, under the rules. The uncertainty is where you do have work for them to do. And this arises from um, slight differences in the wording used in different versions of guidance about whether or not an employee otherwise needs to have been made, laid off or made redundant in order to be furloughed. And we've asked government for clarification on this issue because I think it's a really important one for our members to, to have a bit of certainty on. The other category, which may be difficult for some of our members, is employees who want to possibly switch from sick leave, where they're getting SSP, onto furlough in order to benefit from the increased salary that that might give them. We don't think that employees who are currently self-isolating or are currently in, and currently in receipt of SSP can end this period of self-isolation early. We think they're going to have to wait until the end of that self-isolation period has finished. But once those periods are over, over they would have, and they would otherwise have returned to work, they will then be able to move on to furlough if they consent. We've also had questions from companies who are concerned about their long-term employees who may be receiving only SSP or nothing at all, and about whether or not their status can be changed. If they're well and recovered, of course, there's no problem with that. However, if they're not, or they may not be well enough to return to work, there's a risk that if you move those employees onto furlough, that an HMLC were to investigate, that you may not be able to claim back the contribution you expected for their salary. So probably a simple question to ask yourself is simply whether you think an occupational health report would support them returning to work now. Also, don't forget to consider what would happen at the end of furlough. If you do bring them back to work to put them on furlough, you're going to risk resetting the clock in relation to their sick pay entitlement and any uh, any and the place they are within your your absence management procedures. There's also a bit of a question mark about agency workers who aren't in employees, and we deal with that in our online FAQ. So do take a look at those. Moving on now to selecting employees for furlough. Now, the government guidance helpfully notes that employers can use the furlough provisions, even though some employees are still working. Selection clearly isn't going to be an issue if you're just stopping all your production, although there may be one or two difficult decisions amongst your business support functions who you may be keeping working. Um, but this next section, I want to look at what happens when you need to select for furlough because you're reducing rather than stopping your operations. So how do you do this? The first point to make is that although there's nothing to stop an employee asking to be put on furlough leave, there's equally no obligation on an employer to say yes. It's up to you, the employer, whether or not you furlough any particular person. Choosing to who you furlough isn't quite the same as choosing who you're gonna make redundant. So I think you probably would find that if you have a bit of a redundancy mindset, this might give you a helpful framework when considering some of the issues. So given that as a first step, just as you would in a redundancy situation, I'd suggest you think quite carefully about which roles you still need employees to perform and the numbers you need for each role. Bear in mind increased levels of sickness absence, which are quite likely over the next few weeks. Um, and also which roles you have which are critical. So you might need to have more than the minimum number of employees still at work in case someone's ill. Again, as for redundancy, once you've identified the numbers you need to place on further in particular roles, I think a really good approach would be to ask employees to volunteer for furlough. I think this will just reduce senses, any sense of unfairness really. Some employees may prefer to continue to work and receive full pay, while others may prefer to stop work and remain home on reduced pay for all sorts of reasons. Now, if the number of volunteers doesn't match the numbers you need to furlough, 
you'll need to come carry out some sort of selection process, either to decide which volunteers to turn down for furlough, or if you've got too few employees, well, if too few employees volunteer to be furloughed, which to choose to furlough. This won't be particularly easy, particularly if you're in serious financial difficulty and under time pressure. In both scenarios, the safest thing would, of course, be to conduct an objective selection exercise on a role by role basis, aiming to keep the employees who are best suited to the work you've still got to do. And ideally, you'll do this by looking at easily identifiable, measurable skills. But in reality, it's probably inevitable for in a lot of companies that practical considerations and employee relation issues will take precedence. I think this is a situation where it's really difficult to give generic advice. So if you're listening and you're a Make UK member and you're facing this dilemma, do get in touch with our national advice line or your advisor and they'll be able to support you with this decision. We've got a number of member companies who are in fact facing this issue and are thinking of rotating groups and of employees on and off furlough. So you have one group on furlough for three weeks and then you swap with another group of employees as they see that as being a fair, a fairer option than other, carrying out any other sort of selection process and we're going to talk a bit about whether or not you can do this later. Finally on this slide there's a, just a reminder that equality and discrimination laws will apply as usual but just to flag that while of course you've still got to take care not to discriminate when you're selecting which employees to furlough it may be in the current circumstances that some discriminatory otherwise discriminatory selection decisions might actually be justifiable given the current circumstances for instance, if you're selecting employees aged over 70 to be furloughed, normally that would amount to age discrimination. But given the health and safety uh, driver for this decision, you may find that it's a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim at the moment. Again, talk to us if you're thinking of doing this. So once you've decided who to furlough, what process should you follow to put employees on to furlough? The first point to make is that employees must agree to the furlough leave as it involves a change in their terms and conditions in relation to pay as well as into the relation as well as in relation to the provision of work. We think it's generally going to be quite likely that employees will agree when the alternative is redundancy. Um, though of course we do have member companies where um, the unions are quite keen on agreeing to have 100% pay rather than the 80%. As always, good communication with employees is gonna really help this process run smoothly. I know that face-to-face -face meetings with all effective staff may well be difficult at the moment, but if you can, perhaps you can try and arrange some form of meeting with employees, such as you know, via Zoom or Skype or on the phone to explain to them what you're proposing and the reasons why furlough is necessary at this moment for their job in your business. Next, write to the employee, setting out the details of the proposals, and we've got a template letter on our website. Don't forget to get a record of the employee's agreement to the change proposed in the letter. That's really important. We suggest that you do this by imposing really quite a short time frame. Time is definitely of the essence in these processes, so maybe just give them 24 or 48 hours to respond to you. You'll also need to think about the practicalities of getting employment, given that many employees may already be at home, and they may not have access to you know, the relevant technology. And again, we've got quite a few ideas about how to do that, which are embedded into the notes of our furlough letter, which is on, which is on our website on the Coronavirus Hub. Finally, just going to quickly mention the collective aspects of getting agreement and what to do if you've got a, a, a trade union because you should be engaging with them. There are one or two complications around this. So the best thing is probably to have a quick look at our FAQs on our website. And if you're dealing with this issue to with your advisor, if you're a member of the company or, or call the national advice line. So what do you do if employees don't agree? You've sent them the first letter and you haven't got their consent back. I'd suggest that you give employees more than one, more than one chance. You may also want to have a quick uh, chat with employers or, or your union if you're a union in a nice workplace. 
give them a quite a short timetable to get back to you again, but do reiterate the need for furloughing, the benefits to the employees and the alternatives, because often the alternatives will just be worse for employees than being furloughed. So if the alternative is actually that you're going to lay them off or move to redundancies, employees need to be really clear about that. So give them one more chance, listen to any genuine concerns they've got, but if they don't get consent within the extended time frame, you're going to just have to move on to the next stage probably quite quickly. And if this next stage involves redundancy, remember that the usual redundancy consultation requirements will, will apply. And just as a quick reminder of that, that will be a minimum of 30 days consultation where 20 or more redundancies are proposed within a 90 day period, or 45 days where 100 or more redundancies are proposed. Now, if you're facing cash difficulties because of the current crisis, you might struggle to give that amount of notice. So it's worth noting that there is a special circumstances defence, which it's possible you may be able to use in order to shorten that period. But if you're thinking of making use of that, please get in contact with your Make UK advisor if you're a Make UK member listening today. I'm now going to hand over to Tim Thomas, who's going to talk to you about what happens to terms and conditions during furlough. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Charlotte. Uh, Tim, you should be able to take control of the slides uh, now. Just before you start doing that, Tim, apologies if anyone's getting us a few audio connections uh, on today's uh, session. We're all at the mercy of home broadband, but just a reminder that a copy of the recording will be sent out after this after the session closes. Um, over to you, Tim. Uh, Tim, you might be on mute there. Can you hear us OK? Am I coming through now, Roger? You loud and clear. Perfect. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, I want you all. Um, super presentation supervised by Charlotte, filling us in all the, the latest details there. Just before I start, yes, um, Make UK taking all that information from members, all those questions, all that intelligence, going back to government to get um, as many answers as quickly as possible. As Charlotte said, still some uncertainty. This is a rapidly develop an area, some great FAQs on our website. Um, different versions of government guidance coming out. We're doing all we can to make sure we give you the best information in real time. And uh, just to take my co-presenters by surprise, whilst we've been on the webinar, I've been receiving some emails from um, various contacts um, within different parts of government. So we've got some more information to update you on at the next webinar. And we've got some calls later today with officials with all those questions that Charlotte's been referring to. Hopefully we'll get some more answers later on today and we will come back to you when we know more. So without further ado, let's press on with the slides and some more information. So what happens to terms and conditions during furlough? Well, government guidance is very clear on that. It says that employees have the same rights as they did previously. So as Charlotte said, this is essentially just another authorised period of absence. Uh, designed to give access to a grant scheme in these very testing times. So that means that all the statutory rights, so maternity, other forms of family leave, protection from unfair dismissal, everything else that you will be familiar with on the call, that bundle of employment rights, well, they don't alter just because someone is on furlough. Now, contractual terms, they'll stay the same unless changes can be agreed. Difficult circumstances, but clearly this is an opportunity that potentially employees could agree some changes to contractual T's and C's for the furlough period. If you're thinking about doing that, clearly communication is key. Charlotte's just taking you through a process that we suggest for getting agreements to furlough, but I think all employees at this time will want to be sensitive uh, to the concerns of their employees, their workers, uh, and some might be uh, concerned as to what the future is going to hold. So weigh up risks if you're thinking about changing some T's and C's at this time. And be aware of complications if employees won't agree. Charlotte's just taking you through the situation where what if you don't get employee agreement to furlough and what position does that leave you in? So uh, think again and think very hard before you try and change T's and C's at this, this point. And we don't think it's appropriate for you to make permanent changes as part of this process. Any changes we think should just relate to the furlough period. So let's move on. How long does furlough last and can you rotate employees on and off furlough? Lots of questions from Make UK members on rotation. Lots of manufacturers clearly have um, perhaps different shifts or different categories of workers or workers with different skills 
or they're concerned that perhaps if they furlough their workers uh, and then uh, they find they need them back, they need some uh, to meet some unforeseen demand, what can they do and how can they meet this? So how long does furlough last and can you rotate? Well, as Charlotte's explained, the minimum furlough period is three weeks and the claim is for a three week block. Uh, employees can be furloughed more than once. As I've said already, there's a number of different parts of government guidance out there. There's an employee guide, an employer guide. There was an original announcement, a new announcement. And so the amalgamation of everything is that employees can be furloughed more than once. And the guidance indicate that these um, can actually be periods that could be extended or consecutive. Um, the scheme's intended to last for three months, March to May. Um, we believe that actually you're more likely to get your first payment towards the end of that period. And it can also be extended if the conditions uh, that currently exist in relation to COVID-19 carry on. So um, in terms of rotation, we think there's a, a fairness element to this. So you could rotate or think of rotate half the workforce on furlough and half work and then swap. We think this rotation uh, model is possible. But as I mentioned before I started my section of the slides, it's one of the issues that we've gone back to them on to be absolutely crystal clear that rotation is possible within the rules. We think on the basis of these three sets of announcements I've referred to that we can do it, but it would be nice if government could definitively say, yes, rotation, providing you comply with the three week further period, you can do it. So moving on, what if circumstances change during the furlough period? Now, clearly at the moment, the news and the announcements from government are changing day by day, sometimes hour by hour. It's very difficult for businesses to be able to foresee exactly what's going to happen in the next few uh, weeks, let alone the next few months. So what if you furlough someone and then an employee falls ill during the furlough period um, or switches to sick leave? Or what if a furloughed employee um, wants to be brought back to work to cover absence of someone who's fallen ill? And what if there's periods of furlough um, that can be alternated with periods of holiday? Uh, many members asking us that, can we do some furlough and some holiday? We'll cover that off separately. But all these I would put in the category of, yes, we're going back to government for some greater clarity at the moment. Um, and we're trying to find out what exactly the um, position is in terms of furlough and holiday and furlough and other forms of leave. This is a, a we don't know category. Um, our best guess at the moment is, is, as Charlotte's explained, that you've got this fixed term period and actually there's not an awful lot of flexibility around that. But keep in touch with Make UK, keep checking the coronavirus part of our website and keep looking at the FAQs. Can employees work for you or anyone else during a period of furlough? Again, lots of questions coming in um, from members on this uh, and actually also questions I think, from employees in general wondering what they can do during the period of furlough. So uh, this is a fairly straightforward one, no. Um, if you're on furlough, um, then the idea is that they're not doing any work for the employer, not even reduced hours. Uh, so furlough is a period of authorised leave of absence and the government guidance is pretty clear that during that period, people shouldn't be working for their employer. Okay, well, that's an easy one. Let's move the conversation on. What if an employer, employee has a second job? Can they continue to work for that second employer? Well, our view is, is they can. If they've already got a second job, they're doing two jobs at a time, then those two positions operate independently. Uh, so you could be furloughed by one and not the other. Can an employee undertake training at home? Uh, yes, they can undertake that training at home. There is a slight glitch on a minimum wage point there. So if they're undertaking uh, web-based training at home, they need to get at least the minimum wage. Can they volunteer? Yes, they can. Government guidance has been very clear that volunteering, so particularly at the moment, people might be wanting to volunteer um, to support perhaps the health service um, or uh, any other reason to do with COVID-19 or generally, yes, they can volunteer. The part that is slightly more unclear is whether an employee can then take a new paid job elsewhere. Emphasis there and that's it's on the new. We think they can't. We don't think that's possible. It seems to run against the spirit of the idea of furlough. The idea of furlough is that someone is essentially on leave, not working for their employer. Could they then take a new job elsewhere? I don't think that's possible, but as Roger touched on and as Charlotte touched on, I said, that's one of the questions that we're going back to government on to seek some definitive clarification. 
So next on to holidays. Can an employee be on holiday and furlough uh, during the same time? So we believe that holidays like to continue to accrue during furlough leave. Um, that seems, I think, a very, uh, we don't know. And these are the unknowns, and these are the, uh, the unknowns that we're hopefully going to fill you in on, on the next webinar. So what we don't know, whether an employer can require their employees on furlough leave to take holiday, and if so, whether they can do so by giving them notice in the usual way that you'll be familiar with. What else don't we know? Whether employees can ask to take holiday during the period of furlough leave to top up their pay to 100%. So you remember from our previous webinars and what Charlotte's already said, that actually during furlough, an employee might not be on their full pay. So might they want to take some holiday during specific periods to top it up to 100%. You can see why employees might want to do that. Um, that's what we don't know at the moment. Whether a furloughed employee's contract that designates bank holidays as holidays means that the furlough is going to be interrupted. And there's a bit of time pressure there because clearly we're about to reach the point in the calendar year where there will be some back holidays uh, and our or will certain furloughed employees taking those back holidays mean that the furlough that three week period then gets interrupted and what's the impact of this uh, on, um, on furlough pay and holiday pay so a bucket of issues there um, and the best answer at the moment is we don't know with all certainty check out our FAQs for some more information on the website on where we think this conversation is heading but as soon as those calls and, and as soon as those uh, calls for action from government and answers from Make UK, we'll update our FAQs. When you're looking at the FAQs on the website, you will see that they are timed and dated. So you will know whether you're looking at the previous version or the latest version. So how do you calculate pay furlough? So as Charlotte's indicated, it's essentially a grant from government, 80% of gross pay, two and a half thousand pound cap. On top of that, you get the employer mix and the minimum A pension contributions, but read the sentence carefully, you get the employer mix and minimum A pension contributions on the lump I've described, which is the 80% of gross pay subject to two and a half thousand pounds cap. So there is some limitation on the employer mix that you're gonna get back and the minimum A contribution that you're going to get back. Clearly, if you're making larger contributions than those that I've just described, you're not gonna get those from the grant scheme. So how do you calculate it? Well, for salaried employees, it's the gross salary as of the 28th of February. But for employees with variable pay, it's a slightly different calculation. And we think, by the way, for, for salaried employees gross, that's just a, the fixed amount you get. and There's no variable amounts. Employees with variable pay, um, so they could be getting allowances or shift premium or overtime or anything of that nature. Well, for those employees, it's the higher of the following two. It is the monthly earnings in the equivalent of month last year or the monthly average earnings for the tax year 1920. If you've got less than a year's service, it's the monthly average earnings since your start. And there's some uncertainty, as I've just touched on, as to what is going to count on as pay, which we'll come to in a moment. So what deduction should be made from this furlough pay, this amount that employees are going to get? Well, it's going to be subject to the normal deductions, so it will be classified as income, and therefore employees will pay income tax, PAYE, they'll play the employer mix, and they'll pay whatever the employee pension contribution is going to be. So a fairly sort of standard bucket of deductions. The employer remains liable for the, the, the employer mix, the e mix, and the, and the contributions, um, uh, but can claim, as I say, that the grant on the 80% figure capped at two and a half thousand and the minimum a contribution again based on the 80 percent pay capped at two and a half so any extra employer contractual pension contributions over and above that amount are not covered by the scheme so there could be a shortfall there for employers in their usual uh, the usual amounts that they pay on top of our employees salaries and wages and pay so what don't we know about yet about this furlough pay calculation what's the uncertainty well through various government announcements we know that bonuses commission and fees are specifically excluded from that pot of money that you're going to calculate the 80 percent on uh, with a bit of a, a lack of clarity uh, for salaried employees for those with variable pay um, but broadly salary employees 
fixed amount. Anyone that's got any pay that's variable, then we think they're in the, the variable pay calculation that I just explained on the slide before. So um, other types of pay aren't specifically excluded. So we know bonuses, commission fees, they are excluded. Does that mean to say everything else is included? Overtime, shift period, allowances. We know from lots of manufacturers and work we've done in the past, things like gender pay reporting, that there are a myriad of other amounts that go in to make the sort of global employee emoluments that they get. Does that mean everything is included in the calculation? A bit of uncertainty around that at the moment. Um, and what about basing uh, the calculation on the equivalent? Hello, Tim, Mr. Yeah. Can you hear me, Roger? Hello, Tim. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, apologies, folks. We've lost uh, we've lost Tim's connection for a little bit again. Mercy of. Uh... Have you got your Roger? Hello, hello. I'll just finish off that slide then at Charlotte speaking again about what we don't know about furlough pay. Um, I think one of the last points that uh, Tim needed to make was about calculation and monthly pay and how you prorate for employees on furlough for less than a month and out. Quite a bit of feedback from member companies that some employees whose roles and hours of works have changed over the last year may also be finding that furlough pay and the calculation described in that guidance uh, either gives them a win. Moving on now to some questions and some information about how we can help. I've been uh, in the background of the webinar. I'm not sure whether I have got some questions here, Charlotte. Shall I just um, share these with you and we can talk through these on the webinar? Yeah, that sounds great. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. So can employees volunteer whilst they are on foilo leave? Yeah, I think we've very briefly covered that. But yes, employees yes. can volunteer when they're on furlough leave. Um, but a point to flag is obviously to make sure that if your employees are that they're following government guidance about social distancing and self-isolation. And also that guidance may, of course, change. So covering that we want to make sure that employees are following any future updated rules about what what type of activities are appropriate during a, a, a full a lockdown or a, a tighter lockdown than we're on at the moment. Sure, sure. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, and just one more. I know we're close to closing the, the webinar and I know there's lots of questions coming through, which we will answer. Um, and the, and the, the team of legal, legal guys behind the scenes are working to get through those questions. So bear with us, guys, on that. Um, Charlotte, this one is, um, can, can, a furlough, uh, can we furlough an employee who is already serving notice? Yeah, now that's a question we've had quite a, a lot recently, so it's interesting it's been raised again during during the webinar because that's something our advisors have been advising uh, quite a few companies on. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, there's not a 100% clear answer on, on, on that issue. And the problem really goes back to whether or not an employer, an employer is going to need to show that an employee would otherwise have been made redundant or, or laid off when they're furloughing. Um, the counter argument to the issues that that raises and that I, I would say is really that the point of the guidance mm -hmm. is to support employers whose operations are severely affected by coronavirus and if this person was going to be working out their notice when you were at work you would have had to have paid them and the only reason you're not wanting to pay them at the moment is that you don't have work for them to do the only reason why you're sending sending them home so I think although we don't have absolute certainty, if an employee is working out their notice, I think they can, at the moment, our best guess is that they can be furloughed and you would be able to recover the money for the period while they're on furlough. Um, but of course, mm -hmm. there is a little bit of uncertainty around that. Sure, okay. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Um, Tim, I don't, don't know whether you can hear us or not, but um, I think I think a lot of the attendees could could hear you OK. So um, apologies again, guys. We are on um, home broadband, as, as we know. Um, but I hope the, the webinar was of help to you today. Um, as Tim mentioned, we, we will be doing further webinars and obviously covering um, further questions on furlough um, as they come through and, and as we, we, we are working towards that. Do please check out the website hubmateuk.org forward slash coronavirus for any further information. Uh, Roger's also been sending through the FAQs to you as well, so 
please do have a look at those and um, continue to be in contact with us with any inquiries that you do have um, let us know if we can help regular updates are in place on the hub and we're being, and being e alerted as well so please um, register to make sure that you're kept in the loop with, with anything that you need so far so good um make uk is also ensuring the government is aware of impact on virus at, as on the slide so if you wish to feed in please contact covid19 dot inquiries at make uk dot org tim to me there can can you hear us is there anything finally you want to say can you hear me am i back am i back loud and clear i th i believe you yes, are yes, yes. <laughs> No, so I, I think, uh, no, just to add, information in all the time. We've also been on the webinar. I've got some answers to some of the questions um, that we've been raising on the webinar. I think the thing is just to keep close to Make UK at the moment, keep mm -hmm. feeding your questions. Those FAQs constantly being updated. Call this afternoon, so hopefully I'll be able to get some uh, answers to some of the questions that Charlotte was raising, and we'll come back to you very shortly. Great. Thanks again to our presenters today, um, Charlotte and Tim, um, and we'll be in touch soon. Um, take care, everybody, and we'll look forward to hearing you, being with you on the next webinar. Thank you.